with Jocla 66 Hour of the Truth, again today in collaboration with my wonderful brother in Christ, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, who is joining me thousands of miles from here. We are connected via Skype to do another session, another reading, another teaching or another preaching where we show you that the New Testament is the infallible proof that Jesus Christ fulfilled Daniel's 70-week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27, completely and perfectly 2,000 years ago. Without being the promised Messiah in Daniel chapter 9, uh, Jesus Christ being the Messiah, there would not even be a New Testament. That's a point we already made in earlier broadcasts, and our goal is to show you in the listing of the 10 points we started reading last time, that it is absolutely ridiculous to insert any Antichrist or any Futurism into Daniel's prophecy, chapter 9, verses uh, 24 through 27. And will always, of course, I have wonderful help in my brother Tom Fress, who is very well read and very well studied in the subject. And um, we both pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, because it is not for what I say or what Tom says, it is what the Holy Spirit allows us to say, because only that is the truth. Ain't that right, Tom? That's right. Uh, we're just conveying uh, scriptural truth, and the Holy Spirit be bears witness uh, with the truth, with the scriptures. And that's, uh, we count on the Lord's leading, guidance, and direction. And uh, we've got good news that that leading, that guidance, and that direction has resulted in a truth that is hard to quibble with, to, hard to refute. And uh, it puts to rest once and for all this cockamamie idea that the 70th week of Daniel's future, that 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled by Messiah the Prince 2,000 years ago. And now we need to take a real look at the world. And particularly, since the Antichrist is not future, he's historical. And we prove who the Antichrist is through scripture, history, and prophecy. And the scriptures bear witness to the truth. The historicist uh, school of interpretation is the correct 
And that leaves us with a historical antichrist. The rise of the papacy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the beast, uh, the, uh, the man of sin, the Judas priest is the papacy. It's always been the papacy. It always will be the papacy. And uh, the papacy is Christ's nemesis. The papacy is the great enemy of the church of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's the papacy that reigns and rules over the kings of the earth. Okay? The kings of the earth govern at his say-so. And uh, they, don't re they don't respond to the people. Okay? That's an illusion. They answer to the papacy. It is the papacy who places upon their heads their, their crowns, and it is the papacy who can remove that crown at his will. And so, therefore, the kings of the earth serve the pope. And uh, Can I it, interrupt it, it, you there for a second, Tom? Certainly. I'm very, I'm very sorry to do so, but you say something that I want to share with you, and the, the problem is that I cannot share that in English. I found okay. a new uh, PDF um, a few days ago that was uh, that is called Rome's Ziele in Theory and Praxis, which means Rome's goals in theory and in practice. So that's in German. It's a paper, a paper from 1907. Okay. So the interesting stuff is on the page before here, and you can see this is old fracture writing, as we call it. It's old German writing uh, that you know from the 18th and 19th century. And here is a quote from Pope Pius X in his Motto Proprio. That is probably a publication of Pope Pius X that you also have heard of earlier, because I think in all the uh, readings that you did uh, on real history, you probably f stumbled upon Motto Proprio. That was published on the 18th of December 1903. And he says here, and I, I try to translate that into German, it's not uh, into English. It's not so easy because um, I cannot copy paste the text and put it in the translator. I have to do it uh, here uh, by, by heart, by understanding. It says, in Erfüllung ihrer Aufgabe hat sich die christliche Demokratie in strengster Abhängigkeit von der kirchlichen Behörde zu halten. That means to fulfill its destiny and, and its, work, it, 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 its work it has to do. The Christian democracy has to be in strongest adherence of the churchly office by which it adheres to the bishops and their organs and um, does serve in absolute obedience to them. Okay. It is not a uh, meritable uh, Zeal, zeal, nor does it speak of any kind of zealousness uh, if man uh, only adheres to good and nice things without the um, uh, approval of the uh, uh, of the highest shepherd, something like that. I, I, I yeah, can for the pope. moment not, not, not put it any better. Yeah, of course, um, or or the bishop. Yeah. The bishop mm -hmm. that uh, that works there. Uh, the right. point is, um, in fulfilling their um, duty, the Christian democracy has to be in strongest um, abhängigkeit. Means um, um, abhängigkeit. Oh, oh, let me just <laughs> translate that. Well, I know it, but um, dependency, dependence, in strongest dependence. Yeah. The Christian democracy has to be in strongest dependence of the church office, mm -hmm. which is placed over them by the bishops and their organs. And the bishops, of course, are only the representatives of the popes. This mm -hmm. is such a sentence that out of the mouth of the beast that you see here in the picture, the Pope of Rome is the Antichrist, that absolutely confirms what you just said and what you yes. just said was nothing else but the quote of Revelation chapter 17 verse 2 or chapter 18 verse 3. That's right. Incredible. I, I just yeah. found this sentence. I thought, wow, 
this is in motu proprio. It says to fulfill its uh, duty, the Christian democracy has to be in the strongest dependence of the church organs. Bang! Okay. <laughs> Can you be more clear than this, Tom? That's right. It's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And this is the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy. The historical Antichrist is, was, and always will be the papacy. And he rules and reigns over the kings of this earth, including uh, the president of the United States. And he must, as, a, as the leader of a Christian nation, respond responsibly and solely to the church organ, that is, the Roman Catholic papacy. Okay? He receives his crown from the Pope, and the Pope can take his crown. Okay? And if necessary, the Pope can take his head with the crown. And that has happened repeatedly in world history, oh, yeah. and even in the United States of America, and that best explains what happened to John F. Kennedy. Oh, it's also happened in the 2000s with uh, Gaddafi yeah, in Libya, with absolutely. Hussein in Iraq, and many others. I mean, It's called regime change. It's, it's called regime called, change, yeah. That's right. A de facto government... Becomes uh, a de jure is, government by it, regime it change. At the, at the earliest convenience, is, is taken out of the way, and then a de jure government is put in its place, which means a government that will re be responsible to the Pope. But what, what I just find so wonderful, Tom, is that now a few days ago I uh, found this um, PDF because it was uh, sent. The link was sent to me, um, not the link to the PDF, but to another paper that leads to the PDF, on one of my uh, German videos, and that I had time to read a few pages of this, and that I read exactly this sentence today, this noon. I read this this morning. I had about an hour or so time to read the paper a little bit. And just reading about this, that this is absolutely necessary for a so-called, so quote-unquote, Christian democracy in uh, fulfilling their duty, they have to submit completely and be obedient absolutely to the church hierarchy. This That's is right. just so wonderful to find this. And, and this, Tom, is to me also a sign that the work that we are doing here is led by the Holy Spirit. He shows us in different languages. He shows us from different times, because we are speaking here of the beginning of the 20th century, proof that what we are saying, often with our own words, is just confirmed by the Antichrist and his minions itself in the world for everybody to find. Everybody can find these papers, and the Holy Spirit just right. let me to find this. And this is just what I find so wonderful. And again and again, I think this is the legitimization of these broadcasts in the very first place. That exactly. it shows that we really don't speak of our own, but that we just tell what the Spirit leads us to say. Yep. The only the only thing that keeps the general populace of this country from understanding these things and knowing these things is because these papal decrees, these papal encyclicals uh, and pastoral letters are written to the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church and they're written in Latin, okay? And then from there, they are interpreted and then our government takes instruction from the bishops, okay? Whenever you see a bishop walk into the, to the, uh, the White House, he's the boss, okay? He is the representative of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in this world, the papacy. And when the Bishop of New York walks into the White House, he is the boss. He's there to check up on the papal uh, vassal in the White House. And if that papal vassal isn't doing his job, isn't doing what the papacy wants, he can be warned, he can be threatened, and he can be removed. Now, on some other pretense, uh, uh, the, 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 the people are misinformed. But the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the papacy, and surely the occupant of the White House knows why they're being defrocked or de dethroned. Okay? So, it's a, so uh, like I've described so many other times in other broadcasts, on other programs, 
uh, the Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country, the bishops, the archbishops, the priests, all together form the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church in this country. Each and every one, bishop, archbishop, priests, nuncios, all of them form a shadow government. They shadow our government. They keep direct uh, contact with and observance, uh, observation of our government and report to the, the bishop who reports to the pope. And that's how this country is run, by, indirectly by the pope. And the laws of this country are commensurate with Roman Catholic canon law. That's how they make us Roman Catholic without our knowledge, without our approval, without our consent. And uh, that's how Protestantism is conquered. And not only do they rule and reign over the kings of the earth, but they are the authors of what we've been talking about all along. That is futurism, the belief that Daniel's 70th week is future. That means the Antichrist is future, and it can't be the pope. It can't be the history of the papacy. It can't be uh, every pope in succession from the first to the last. You can't have it both ways. You can't believe that the Antichrist is a single individual that comes just before Christ's literal return, uh, 2,000 years after Christ, and then believe at the same time that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. Every generation of Christians from the first century to, to about 1800 A.D. believed that the papacy and every pope in succession from the first to the last is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. No one had ever even heard of futurism, the idea that the Antichrist is just one single individual and that he doesn't come until just before Christ returns. All that does is blind, ignorant, stupid, misinformed, illiterate, uh, deceived Christians to believe that the papacy is not the Antichrist, that he's just another Christian leader. And like I pointed out the other day, uh, and I don't mean to seem blasphemous, I'm going to tell you the truth. Anybody who calls Roman Catholicism Christianity has blasphemed the name of Christ. You, you can't liken... The, the Church of Antichrist to anything of Christ. To call the Roman Catholic Church a Christian church is to blaspheme the name of Christ, and we must stop it, all right? And we must stop believing in this future phony Antichrist and believe in the historical Antichrist. We have to return to the original teaching of the Church since the first century up until 1800 A.D., that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. And until we do that, nothing, nothing of history is going to make any sense. Now, we've said, the Bible says, that the papacy rules and reigns over the kings of the earth. And the people are drunk with the, with the wine of that fornication, that, that unholy uh, 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 copulation, if you will, between the governments of the world and the man of sin in Rome. That, that, that filthy union has corrupted the whole world. Okay? Now, now, we could do something about that corruption if we'd stop believing in this phony future Antichrist and start seeing the papacy and his rule and reign over the kings of the earth as that which God abhors. And we'd pray against it and preach against it. Okay? But uh, we're not wanting to do that because we still believe in the rapture that's going to happen, they say is going to happen about the time the, the, the future Antichrist comes. Well, let me tell you, it's not going to happen. And uh, you're going to all be, be believing that you've been left behind somehow. And where will go your faith? Where will your faith go? Now, Yerk, as wonderful uh, a servant of the Lord as he is, he has taken uh, opportunity to find out of Rome's own mouth, by Rome's own hand, Pope, Le uh, Pope uh, Pius X wrote this, art this article, this, this uh, pastoral letter, this encyclical, 
showing the responsibility that the Christian governments of the world have to respond and to serve the papacy. I just think, Tom, the expression Christian democracy, that says it all, doesn't it? Sure does. How often do, didn't the American presidents refer to a Christian democracy in their country? Yeah. I mean, and this is so in your face when you read this. Uh, I was oh. just looking, I was just trying to, to find if I can the, find the paper fast, but uh, it needs a little bit more research because uh, before I can find that online, that of 1903 didn't show up. But I'm quite sure that you can find it, but most probably only in Latin, uh, maybe. Uh, maybe you can find it in another language. But just the expression, Christian democracy, that was to me a hit in the face, you know? Yeah. That's what they installed in Germany after World War II, a Christian yeah. democracy. That is what yeah. they want to sell as the United States of America is, a Christian democracy, yeah. where uh, the United States of America actually is a republic, not a democracy, but, but that's something yeah. else. They changed it slowly <laughs> so that you don't feel it, you know, like the, no, like the frog you put in cold water and then turn up the heat. It's, but, but that expression, Christian democracy, that should ring the bells in everybody's head who is listening to this video and say, wow, they sell us Christian democracy and say they have to be submissive to the Pope in total and utter obedience? Yeah, no, That's I don't what the Pope the wrote. I don't want to leave the listeners the notion that this is the only document of its kind. No, oh, sure papacy, not. The papacy has always reiterated its authority over the kings of the of the earth. Syllabus of the errors papacy. of Pope Pius IX, eh, for example. Pardon? The syllabus of errors of Pope Pius IX, for example. Yeah. It's one of the papers where he condemns all, quote unquote, um, governments of the people, by the people, for the people. Right? That's right. That's right. Every government is to serve the man of sin in Rome. That's the law. Okay, you're going to call yourself a Christian nation. You must have a government that serves the king of kings and the lord of lords. Self-proclaimed <laughs> king of kings and lord of lords, Tom. Well, certainly, hopefully the <laughs> listeners understand. <laughs> and, and I don't have to explain. I mean, for crying out loud, I mean, uh, certain things have to be understood. The no. king of kings and the lord of lords is Christ Jesus and him only. Anyone else who calls himself King of Kings and Lord of Lords is a counterfeit. A usurper. He's an anti-Christ counterfeit. And that's what the papacy is, was, and always will be. And uh, he claims and exercises his authority, uh, self-styled, if you will, his own divine right to rule over the kings of the earth, and he has for its entire existence. It still does today. And I, and I just know that there are people listening that is just rolling their eyes back in their head, thinking, oh, oh, the Pope doesn't rule our government. The Pope doesn't rule our government. Oh, yes, he does. And the, and the more you look at it, the more you'll see it from your, for yourself. If you want to deceive yourself, if you want to remain deceived, you go right ahead. Okay, but Yerk just read a, a German uh, a, 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 a printing of Pope Pius X showing a Christian government's responsibility to serve and to answer to the papacy. Okay, that's not a forged document. And that's only one of multitudes of documents that have been issued by the papacy over the centuries, just like it. Okay? And, uh, you know, any, anybody who's understanding at all of history, has got any understanding of history at all, understands that the kings of the earth had to do the bidding of the pope. And if they didn't, they were... Uh, executed or by any other means removed from office and replaced. That, I've just described to you the, the wars of the world. The wars of the world are fought 
the papacy over any government that won't serve him. And the papacy has at his, his disposal the, mil, the militaries of every nation in this world to go to war against a de facto government, a government that will not serve the papacy. The papacy can literally control the militaries of the world. And if you consider the, the, the technological advances made by the United States military, the, the military supremacy of the United States, and to contemplate the possibility or the very real fact, if you'll permit me, the very real fact that that military serves the papacy, then you ought to have hair growing on the back of your neck. Okay? You worried about nuclear annihilation? You worried? Remember, remember the Cold War and all the exercises we did getting underneath the desks and all? Do you know that the nuclear arsenals of this country are ultimately controllable by the papacy? There's no 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 king in this country that has nuclear power is authorized to use it without the po the pope's approval. And if a, 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 a renegade government begins to uh, uh, work on nuclear technology and give itself the potential to respond in a nuclear attack, a, a nuclear war, without the papacy's approval, guess what? The United States military goes on a slander campaign against that government to justify a war to remove the capabilities of those foreign governments. There you have your answer to the Iran sanctions that exactly were put on right. in the last years. Huh? What you have is a de facto government in Iran developing uh, a nuclear deterrent, uh, a potential nuclear offense against the Pope's great warring crusader, the United States of America, and the United States is free to just perpetrate whatever atrocity against Iran to stop that nuclear deterrent. That, you know, that's what you're seeing on the television every night. Because if and Iran was developing nuclear weapons and did build them, and they had control over them, the Pope would not control the nuclear weapons. And that is something that the Pope cannot let happen. That is what Tom tells right. you here. The yep. Pope has the ultimate authority over all nuclear weapons. Those from the USSR, former, or Russian Confederation, or whatever you want to call it today. Those of China, those of India, those of England, those of France, those of the United States of America. All the quote-unquote nuclear powers, their nuclear weapons are controlled by the papacy, not by those nations. And That's if right. another, nation's, or another nation all of a sudden comes up with the idea to build their own nuclear weapons under their control, the Pope is just getting furious. That's right. And everybody, you know, is curious, why, why is God allowing all this? Well, I'll tell you what I think it is. It's just my, th my thoughts. You can, you can believe it or not. But... Rome desperately needs a refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. She sacrificed millions and millions of lives in World War I to make it possible. She sacrificed another millions and millions and millions of people during the Second World War to make a future 70th week of Daniel possible. And now God keeps throwing monkey wrenches into the works and postponing this future 70th week of Daniel until... Rome is getting frustrated. And until some people wake up, Tom. That's right. Giving, giving people the time to wake up, study history, study the Bible, study the real, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, how, how everything hangs together, how everything is connected. God gives us the time to study, to understand, and by that, to be saved, because he doesn't mm -hmm. want anyone to perish. Why is God postponing this future 70th week of Daniel? Why doesn't he just give the papacy and the United States and all the governments that serve the Pope the, the, the power to have this future 70th week of Daniel? Build a temple, have somebody sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, allow them to, build, to uh, restore animal sacrifices and one thing and another, and so they can cause a phony antichrist to, to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease, and then bring in the Pope as the Christ. 
why, why do you think God is keep postponing this? Because why does God loves, keep throwing monkey wrenches into it? He's just waiting for us to wake up. He's he just loves, waiting for us to wake up to the futurist lies and return to historicism. You know, it's getting embarrassing for the papacy. It's getting embarrassing for, for England. It's getting embarrassing for the United States of America because ever since 1948, Israel's been a nation. And here it is, 2021, and we still don't even have a temple built on Temple Mount. When are we going to have our 70th week of Daniel? God just keeps throwing the monkey wrenches in, and we just keep biding our time, hoping for an opportunity to fulfill the 70th week of Daniel, and God just keeps putting monkey wrenches in the works. Now we've got Iran building nukes. We've got outbreak of, of, of uh, military uh, activity in, in uh, Syria and all kinds of d disturbance with China and threat of potential war in China. It just, it's just not working out for the man of sin in Rome, and he's getting frustrated. Why don't we just wake up? Why don't we just wake up to the historical truth? That's what God's waiting for. God is mercifully throwing monkey wrenches into the Pope's works on Temple Mount in Jerusalem so we'll wake up. But we don't look like we're going to wake up. We're going to stay in this futurist stupor until Judgment Day, it looks like, because we, oh, we just love that rapture so much. We just, you know, if we give up on futurism, we got to give up on the rapture. So let's just stay stupid, shall we? I mean, it's just so frustrating to me. I, I just, you know, I lose my, my decorum when I start realizing just how stupid we are. And are we stupid? Or we just blindly believed Jesuit liars, futurist lies, dedicated to exonerating the papacy from its historical role, nearly 1,500 years of the Antichrist's existence in this world. A false Christianity, a false Messiah, a false Christianity, a false gospel, a false Jesus, a false propitiation, a false grace, a counterfeit of the true. Why don't we wake up to it and condemn it for what it is instead of playing along with its futurist facades, its futurist games? The world is only going to become more chaotic the longer this futurist 70th week of Daniel is postponed. And uh, they're going to use whatever power at their, expo their disposal to fulfill their phony, futurist 70th week of Daniel. And if God keeps throwing monkey wrenches in the works and postponing their ability to fulfillment this phony future fulfillment, they're going to resort to more drastic measures, more drastic measures, more and more drastic measures to the world's going to become more, so, uh, so tumultuous, so full of fear and foreboding that people are going to become, uh, going to start having heart attacks. You know, this uh, men's hearts failing them for fear after looking upon those things which are coming upon the earth. What's coming upon the earth? Roman terror. Rome's throwing a tantrum. And she don't care who she hurts. Look what she's already hurt. How many did she hurt in World War I? How many did she hurt in the Second World War? How many is she killing today? Rome will sacrifice the whole of God's creation for the fulfillment of a future 70th week of Daniel. Everything they placed all their cards in a future 70th week of Daniel. There you have your explanation of the Georgia Guidestones.
That's right. Keep humanity under 500 million because 500 million are controllable in comparison to 8 billion and a half what the population is apparently growing to. Well, that's, that's at least what they tell us. The when they get, rid, when they get rid of all the old people, Tom, now with this corona idea that they post here, and we have only seen just the beginning of that, we will yeah. see much, much more. Because I believe that the murals of the Denver airport are showing us something that is going to come. When I see the smirking face of Bill Gates, when he speaks of, well, that first virus didn't get the attention it should have, but wait until the second comes, that will give you all. When I see that smirking face of that jerk, sorry, that expression, and his wife on the camera, as in one of my videos on BitChute, where you can look, uh, where you can watch this. I'm just going to show you that. Um, then it is in the picture here. It is about this vaccine expert Gerd van den Bosch. Yeah? There is this Bill Gates uh, in interview in. When you understand that they are planning to eradicate 90% or 95% of world's population, you know why. They have to begin with the old, because the old are still studied in the things that we are teaching here. Many right. old people have understanding of biblical historicism. They are in the way of a fulfilling of a new world order. They need to kill everybody they do not control. And they can easily control 500 million, but they cannot control 8 billion. And so that's why the great quote unquote culling is coming only because they need to fulfill their 70th week of Daniel. And they don't care if they do it before billions or before millions, but they got to do it. And the less people they do it, the easier they can betray all the people. That's my picture of that. That's what I think of this. I don't know if yeah. Tom shares this point of view. We have not discussed this before the broadcast, but that is my point of view. Kill as many as you can get from uh, all the people who were born in the 20th century, who that you only have to deal with post 9-11 born people who are indoctrinated to oblivions in this world and who are easy to control and then you can play the 70th week of Daniel. That's my assumption. Not long, ago, not long ago on the mere accusation that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, this country went on a crusade. And even after the war, it was openly revealed by our government that Saddam Hussein never had weapons of mass destruction. So what was the purpose of the war? Only God knows. But what we have now is a global germ warfare in this COVID-19 epidemic. Global germ warfare. Now, if the same standard that was used against Saddam Hussein on the mere accusation of weapons of mass destruction was used against our government on its role in the production of the COVID-19 virus at the Wuhan viral factory in, in China, then the annihilation of this government would be justified, wouldn't it? You see, that's the difference between a de jure government that serves the Pope unquestionably and a de facto government like Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein was never had weapons of mass destruction. We had that directly admitted by President George W. Bush. Publicly, in the, reported in the mainstream media, he made a joke about it. But we have a serious, global, weaponized virus, and somebody's responsible for it. Now, do you think God is going to allow one form of justice for Saddam Hussein in Iraq and another form of justice for the government of this country? I tell you what, the justice that is, that is deserved by the government of the United States is, is not coming soon enough for me. But eventually it will come. The Bible plainly says when the dust settles, 
there will be but one government left upon this world, and the head of that government will be Christ Jesus, and all other governments will be ground to powder and blown away with the wind. So saith Daniel in the scripture. God hasten the day. But in the meantime, I want to expose as much of the corruption as this papal government in Washington, D.C. deserves. It, is, it serves not God. It serves not the people. It serves the man of sin in Rome that is operating even in the full gaze of the American people it is working and serving as a vassal for the man of sin, the son of perdition in Rome. And it is the source of all the wickedness in, the, in this world, all the bloodshed, and all for the purpose of fomenting a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. The purpose of which is to bring forward a false antichrist and then a false messiah. When 2,000 years ago, during the real 70th week of Daniel, it was Jesus that confirmed a covenant in his blood for many, for one week of years, one seven-year period of time, and in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by becoming the sacrifice himself. He died for our sins. For the remaining two, three and a half years, the spirit-filled apostles continued to offer that covenant to the to his brethren the jews and to jerusalem until the sanhedrin finally rejected christ and his salvation and stoned stephen and the gospel went to the gentiles the 70th and final week of daniel's prophecy was over 2000 years ago that makes jesus the messiah Messiah the Prince, positively proven in Scripture, proven in prophecy, proven in history as recorded in the New Testament. Now the question is, if the 70th week of Daniel's over, what about the future Antichrist that's going to sign a seven-year peace treaty in the midst of the week going to cause the sacrifice and oblations? What about that future Antichrist? There is no such thing. So who is the Antichrist then? It's the papacy. It is the papacy. It was the papacy. It always will be the papacy. You see, this isn't difficult. Why do people hesitate to believe the obvious truth? Why do they still hope that this future phony 70th week of Daniel has any hope for them? Delusion is called delusion because it's delusional. And it's hard to shake a delusion. It gets right to the marrow of your bones. But we've got to force the truth. We've got to force the, the talk of the true fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel until it overwhelms the fantasy, the future fantasy. And people come back to the truth. People come back to their senses. People come back to the original teaching of the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ for thousands of years. You ask people a thousand years ago who the Antichrist was, they wouldn't wait to take a breath. They would tell you the papacy. What turnip truck did you just fall off of? You don't know who the Antichrist is, for heaven's sake? Why are we so stupid? Because the Jesuits infiltrated the Protestant seminaries and started teaching futurism, thereby exonerating the papacy. And now the papacy is free to rule over the kings of the earth, clandestinely if possible, openly if necessary. But he's back to run, running the governments of this world, just like he was before the Protestant Reformation. And it's all because we believed a lie. We believed a Jesuit delusion, and we will not repent of it because we just love that rapture so much. What do you think God thinks of it? What do you think God thinks of us? Look what it took for the Jews to provoke God to wrath. 
They were taken into Syrian captivity and made slaves. They were scattered all over the world. The chosen people, they're called. And what about Judah? Same thing with faithful Judah. She turned to idolatry. She turned to worshiping God according to the traditions of the Babylonians. So they went off to Babylon and became slaves, just like the Israelites before them. What's going to happen to us? Because we believe lies. What is going to happen to us? The answer is obvious. We're going to be subjects of Rome. We're going to be subjects of a man of sin. What do you think would be easier for, the, for, Ju, for Daniel and Judah to serve Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon or for us in our generation to serve the Antichrist of Rome? You see, God is no respecter of persons. And we're going to be punished just like the Israelites and the Jews were punished before us because we've made the same mistakes. We believe the same lies. We've kept the same man-made traditions, Babylonian roots in all of them. And we just dearly love our Christmas and Easter and Sunday Sabbath and all the other trappings of Roman Catholicism, Halloween, Valentine's Day, birthdays, and everybody tell you, if you ask them, well, God's feast days were for the Jews. Let me tell you something. There's only one holy day, and that's the day that God called holy. No man is holy, and no man can make anything holy. And all these traditions that are believed and observed by the Christian world today, Protestant and Catholic alike, are man-made. They're straight out of Roman mythology, straight out of paganism, and you cannot baptize paganism and call it worship. The whole Christian world has been deceived. The whole Christian world has been corrupted. It is worthless. And it is destined for judgment unless we repent. That we must repent or the full wrath of God is going to be leveled against us. And we've already seen the beginning of it. Shall we wait and hold our repentance until we've seen the worst of it? You listen to all these pretty pastors and pretty preachers on television well, they've got nothing but good things to say. That's why they don't serve the Lord. They serve their belly. They serve filthy lucre. They serve materialism. They love man-made traditions, not the holy days of the Lord. They love their futurist lies, not the historicist truth. And the whole they're going to take the whole Christian world with them to hell on a handbasket. Papacy is going to rule and reign over us just like Nebuchadnezzar ruled, ruled over Daniel and the Jews. There's going to be no difference. We've bought this. We own it, and we need to decide whether we're going through with this transaction or whether we're going to back out and repent. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I've repented long ago. 20 years ago, I repented of all this nonsense. And now I'm down to just me and the clothes on my back. But that's not all I'm prepared to give to tell the truth. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. That was a long introduction into our reading today, wasn't it? <laughs> I don't think that we can really go through with this paper for a long time, so I just want to um, go back into the few verses that we spoke about last week already when we were determining um, that the 70th week of Daniel is not only over, but that we analyzed again the 70th week as we read it here. Uh, from 27 AD to 34 AD that we uh, understood that 
the prophecy was speaking of one consecutive block of time without any uh, gap in there, 20 minutes, 20 years, 200 years or 2000 years or even longer than that. It is one consecutive block of time. Logic requires that. In other words, 70 straight sequential weeks. There is not one example in all of the Holy Script of a stated time period starting, then stopping, and then starting again. Neither is that to be found in Daniel chapter 9. All biblical references to time are consecutive. We have 40 days and 40 nights in Genesis 7-4. We have 400 years of Egyptian captivity in Genesis 15-13. We have 70 years of captivity in Daniel chapter 9 verse 2, and so on. Logic also requires that the 70th week follow immediately after the 69th week. If it doesn't, then it cannot probably be called the 70th week. It is illogical to insert a 2000 year gap between the 69th and 70th week. No hint of a gap is found in the prophecy itself. There is no gap between the first seven weeks and the following 62 weeks. So why do you insert one between the 69th and the 70th week? Daniel 9.27 says nothing about a seven-year period of tribulation. It says nothing of a rebuilt Jewish temple. And it says nothing of any antichrist. The stated focus of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 is the Messiah, and only the Messiah, not the Antichrist. After the Messiah is cut off, referring to Christ's death, the text says, quote, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now in the past this has been consistently applied to the destruction of Jerusalem and the second temple by Roman armies led by Prince Titus in AD 70. But is that the only view? Is that the correct view? No, because we said earlier that the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 is in no place about the Antichrist, only concerning Christ, the Jews and the holy city, Jerusalem. So the prince in verse 26 is Christ. That's why in the AV 1611 Bible in the original version of the King James Bible, the prince who is mentioned twice between verses 24 and 27 is written in capital letters twice to understand that there is no prince in small print as you have in the wrong 1769 Blaney version of the King James Bible. So the prince in verse 26 is Christ and the people are the Jews who by their disobedience are spiritually responsible for the destroying of the temple. The physical destroying was done by the Romans. That's absolutely correct and history proves that. But the responsible, the spiritual responsible is with the Jews. As also the blood of Jesus is on the Jews. Didn't they say we have no, uh, we have no uh, king but Caesar and let the blood of Jesus be on us? To be on our heads and on our heads, on the, on the heads of our children. Exactly. So we come to the sixth point, Tom, and that is where we should continue today. We still have a few minutes, so I suggest we go on. It says, he shall confirm the covenant, remember, and he will confirm or shall confirm the covenant with many for one week in the midst of the week and so on. He shall confirm the covenant. Paul said the covenant was confirmed before by God in Christ. And we read that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 17, quote, and this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Unquote. Jesus Christ came to confirm the promises made to the fathers, as we read in Romans chapter 15 verse 8. Quote, now I say, that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. 
In the King James Version, Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 doesn't say a covenant or peace treaty, but the covenant, which applies to the new covenant. Nowhere in the Bible does the Antichrist make, confirm or break a covenant with anyone. The word covenant is messianic and always applies to the Messiah, not the Antichrist. Now that was a lot of reading and little of explanation and I think we have to go back to where it speaks of Galatians chapter 3 verse 17 because maybe there are some people, Tom, who have questions about this verse. Well, it before says, we do that, I would like to ask the listeners a question. Oh, sure, okay. Do, 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 do the listeners see that the New Testament literally uses the very language of Daniel's prophecy? That, that the New Testament was written for the very purpose of, of, of showing the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy because it uses the self-same language. It's, it's, the point is unavoidable. And somehow the entire church world has missed the point. But it's impossible to miss. The New Testament is confirming what is written in Daniel's prophecy. It's using the same language. This is the written historical record of the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week prophecy. There's no other way to describe it. It's as in your face as anything else in the scripture. It's as undeniable as the truth itself. And uh, how is it that people still believe that the, the 70th week of Daniel is future? when the New Testament is full of the language of Daniel's 70th week. The New Testament is the historical recording of the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. Every jot and every tittle of the 70th week of Daniel is confirmed by one, two, and three witnesses right there in the New Testament. By two or three witnesses, let everything be established. I'll tell you what. There's one thing for sure that has been established in the New Testament, and that is that the 70th week of Daniel is fulfilled, every jot, every tittle. It was fulfilled by Christ, Messiah, the Prince, the Prince that shall come. It is fulfilled, every jot, every tittle, and anybody who says not, or that the, that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, is a liar. And not only is he a liar, he is in denial that Jesus was the Christ. Back to you, Yerk. I switch, just switched my mic off. Uh, I think we are very close to one hour, Tom. I think it is appropriate uh, that we read again uh, very um, diligently what is written here in point number six and that next time we go into the 430 years after that cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect because this is speaking about the law. This is speaking about the um, Levitical sacrifices that were installed 430 years after the covenant um, God made in Christ and, and made with uh, Abraham, the promise he gave to Abraham. I think that is something that we should go in uh, next week, Tom, to make very sure that the people understand it, that also it is what, uh, written here, the covenant, and that is exactly the same wording that is used in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. He will confirm the covenant with many for one week. It's speaking of the same. It is not just a covenant. It is the covenant or the covenant, to even put a little more emphasis on the word. But I think that that is something we should save for next week and maybe then we have the time to go a full hour on this subject. I love what we did today. I love the talking we did today and I'm very glad that the Holy Spirit led me into reading this new paper of Rome's goals in, um, uh, what's it called here, in theory and praxis and uh, practice and that I found this wonderful expression in uh, motu proprio uh, to the um, 
obligation of a quote unquote Christian democracy to be subservient to the papacy. But next time we will go a little bit more into this paper and into analysis and uh, speaking of what is written here and the scriptural references that I put in this paper. But for today, I, uh, I would like to end our broadcast here and uh, give, of course, the concluding remarks to Brother Tom. Yes, okay. Well, certainly if one thing's been demonstrated during this program is that there are grave consequences for believing a lie. We believed in futurism. Now the man of sin, the vicar of Satan himself, now rules the governments of this world. What do you think they're going to do to God's people? There's a consequence for believing futurism. And it's hideous. No words can even describe the horror that is placed upon us now because we believed a lie. I'll let it go at that. I'll see you next week.